So hi everyone, welcome to Gateway to Zen. This is tea program number two of four, hosted by the Clark Museum. Uh, I want to thank our planning team um, and our program leaders, including Holly and Harvey, Humboldt Tycho, Tycho Love, the Mars Project, Little Japan, Orchids for the People, and the Co-op. This event is being recorded, so if you don't want your video to show up in the recording, please turn your camera off now. You'll notice also that you've been muted. Um, that is to protect the sound quality of the program. If you have any questions, you can put them in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so we'll start out today with uh, Tycho performances by Humboldt Tycho, then we'll go over to Holly and Harvey for the first part of their program. There'll be a short intermission with another performance by the Tycho groups here. And then we'll go back to Holly and Harvey for the rest of their pro uh, program. And then we'll come back here, do one last performance by Tycho, and then we'll have our door prize, which everyone's been entered into. So with that, I'll turn it over to Gary Ron to kick things off. Thanks.
Okay. Hello, everybody. Let's give a Tycho a great big hand. Yay. And believe it or not, with the rest of the talk, you will be able to be very tranquil even with Tycho drums. It's a trick. It'll happen. You can do it. My name is Harvey. Konnichiwa, everyone. Welcome. Um, we're going to be doing a couple of little things here for the tea presentation. Holly and I are from the Harai Center, a uh, Ink People Dream Dream Maker. Dream Maker program. And we're going to be talking to you about Zen and tea today. So uh, we have, this is the program where we have two short videotapes. One is a talk about tea and Zen, and it's going to be first. And then we're going to have a demonstration of tea. Very simple, very simple, straightforward one. Then we'll take an intermission. And during that intermission, any of you that are going to be making tea with us that bought the package, going to make tea with us, that's the time to go make sure you have hot water, you'll come back and then we'll do tea together. So it's going to be a lecture on tea and Zen, a short demonstration of tea, the intermission, and then we'll be back and do tea together. During the intermission, we'll have more Tycho. After our presentation, we'll have more Tycho and a drawing. So if our technical people from Mars are ready with the, the first uh, video, we'll get them going. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Konnichiwa, everyone. Welcome to the Clark Museum's tea demonstration. And today, ours is Chano Yu, the tea ceremony, a gateway to Zen. And we're going to be talking about that. And my name is Harvey. I am a Chado Sensei, a tea teacher in the Japanese tea ceremony. And we're going to be talking about tea. We're going to be talking about Zen. And I want one concept for you to get. It's a, it's a Japanese concept. And it is cha, zen, ichi, mi. Cha, zen, ichi, mi. And that means that tea and zen have one taste. And we're going to use that as a foundation for our talk. Now, I teach tea ceremony, and we've done lots and lots of demos, but there's something I have to tell you right off the bat. I think watching tea demos, demonstrations has to be one of the worst things you could possibly do. The only thing worse is not watching a tea demonstration, and that's because if you don't watch one, you may not be introduced to tea, and tea is a wonderful thing. The reason I don't like tea demonstrations is that tea is not a performing art. It is not a kabuki play. It is not a live performance action. It's something that you do. It's not something that you watch. And that's why we built uh, today's experience around for some of you to actually later in the day, we're going to be making tea, to, excuse me, making tea together. And that's, that's what this whole thing is about, is getting you to start having tea in your life in a special way. And we're also using a special tea. It's called matcha. Matcha has become very, very popular in the past dozen years, 20 years actually. And it is powdered green tea. And it is considered a whipped tea and instead of steeping it like you do other teas or brewing it like you do with other teas it's whipped and mixed that way with the hot water another name you'll hear used for chado the way of tea is chano yu and chano yu literally means hot water for tea and it describes the making of and you'll hear it often called the Japanese tea ceremony. And that phrase came about in 1906 from a book 
called The Book of Tea that was written by Okakura. And it is a great example of losing a copyright. You can find an edition of that book anywhere. You can get it free online. You can get it at any bookstore in different editions. And it's a very good book to read after you've had a little experience with tea. And every time you read it, you'll get more and more out of it. So I do suggest that book. It's called The Book of Tea. So with the concept of tea and Zen having one taste, what exactly is Zen? Zen is a Buddhist tradition that came via to Japan, via Korea and China from India. And in India, the concept that became Zen was Dhyana, which is a translation that we have as mindfulness or meditation. It went to China and became Chan, and then it came to Japan and became Zen. And from Zen, uh, Japan, it came to the United States and has kept the term Zen. You'll hear mindfulness talked about a lot these days. Everybody says, oh, be mindful about this and mindful about that. And it is a very good trait. It's a very good skill. It's a very important thing. If you'd like to learn more about it, do find a, a, a Roshi and practice real Zazen. It will go into much more depth. But we're going to show you something else about it today. Mindfulness is one of those things that everybody hears about. Everybody knows something. Oh, well, you're, you're, you're not being mindful about driving the car or washing dishes or whatever it is. Be mindful about this. What they don't explain, and you get this from actually training in Zen, is the mind has many different attitudes that it takes on while you're being mindful and concentrating them. One of them that's very important is called Shoshin, and that means original mind or beginner's mind. And that is the concept of letting go of the prior thoughts that you have about something and being able to see it new and fresh and truthfully every time you bring your attention to it. Um, actually, a very nice example was given um, on NPR's weekend edition, and that would be on Saturday the 23rd of April, 2021. And Yo-Yo Ma gives a very nice, clear understanding of the beginner's mind in just a few words. So that might be a fun thing for you to look at. Beginner's mind is one of those things that probably the most famous Zen story that you'll hear, and you'll hear it all over. It's almost mandatory, I tell you, so you have to listen to it. I'm sorry. And it is about the very wise scholar that came to the Zen priest and wanted to talk about Zen. And this scholar, he sat down and he got an audience with the Zen priest and immediately started talking about what he thought Zen was and why it was this way and why it was that way and, and how Zen could be done this way and why is it done that way. And uh, the priest said, um, would you like some tea? Oh, yes, I'd love some tea. Thank you. Thank you. Tea was brought in on a tray and two cups and the priest handed the scholar the tea cup and started to pour and pour and pour. And the cup filled. He goes, oh, that's enough. That's no, no, that, that, no, that, no, no, wait, 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 wait. And poured all over his hand, all over the floor. He goes, wait, wait, it, but it's already full. Quit, quit. Your mind is like that cup. It's already full. How can I give you any more information, help you to learn new things? If your mind is already made up, it's already full. Empty your cup 
and let's talk. You'll hear that over and over, but that's the concept of Shoshin. Your beginner mind, empty your mind and look anew at what you're doing. After that, another very common thing that your mind will do is Shinjo. Um, Shininjo. And Shininjo is what most people think of as mindfulness. You're actually concentrating on that spot. You're concentrating on your breath. The number of breaths you breathe in, the number of breaths you breathe out, the number of breaths you breathe in, number of breaths you breathe out. And then the mind plays a trick. Ushin. Attachment. Oh, what was that noise? Oh, wait, no, was I breathing right? Oh, no, wait, was it my, uh, no, um, oh, yeah, count, okay, we'll go back to counting. We'll go back to counting. Oh, oh okay. What a lot of people that talk about mindfulness, mindfulness, excuse me, get confused about is they talk about mindfulness, about attention and concentration but they don't tell you what to do when all of a sudden you're concentrating so hard that you've locked yourself into it. You will see in Buddhist statuary, um, them is Kuan Yin in Japan, the goddess of mercy, sometimes arms, and sometimes it's called a thousand arm Kuan Yin. Kanon in Japanese, in Kanon. And how can she have so many arms and everything has a different object in it? How can they all move? And there is a Zen story about the centipede just running along, running along, and then a frog wanting to be a small pest. How do you know one goes? Uh, poor thing stumbled and just gets stuck because it can't think about what to do next. Lock that mind on something is what traps a lot of people and makes it very difficult. Where you want people to get, and it's very because people keep saying mindfulness. Where you called motion, no, your mind is sitting in meditating something. You're you notice this, you notice you get fixed on, you go back, motion, and you'll sit. Of steering toward it. That's what you're doing when you on to something. With Mu Shin, you want your mind to, oh, there, I'm meditating, there's a distraction. Let it go. Go right back to your meditation. Right. We're good. We're right back to that. But we're not. Mu Shin comes. The concept of uh, Mizu no Ro is heart or mind, and Mizu is water. So you have a mind like calm water. Because as you're as you're concentrating on something, I'm sure everybody, especially anybody that's tried to do meditation, your mind starts going in. Oh no no no! I got, oh what's the laundry did did I go shopping? Did I turn off the oh no? Yeah oh what's for dinner? No okay. And your mind starts going like this, and you'll calm down, and then it goes out. And so your mind is like the water in a basin. It keeps moving, 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 until suddenly, at least for a brief moment, it's still. And that's the mind or the heart like water. That's where you're going with Zen. 
Because when you have that, you get a clear understanding of the world. One of my favorite descriptions of Zen is direct pointing at reality. Because you're seeing things for what it really is, not all the little voices in your head. Nothing knowing like this. So, if you think this is something you might like to do, please find a Zendo. Please practice Zen. Even if you practice it at home, there are many places where you can get more information. So look it up. It'll be very handy. Now, I'm going to bring you back to our taste of tea and Zen because for over 30 years, I've been doing tea ceremony. And tea is one of the many arts, especially in Japan, where they were heavily influenced by very powerful and intelligent people, many who had been trained in Zen. And so they were able to develop and say, this is a good practice. And by a practice, what I mean is that instead of having your spiritual practice be where you have to go someplace to do something, oh, well, I'm going to go down to the Zendo, and the, or I'm going to go to this group, and I'm going to do that. The concept of tea is the practice is something that you do every day. So why don't we make that our practice? All of the same things apply. Mindfulness, attention, discipline, all of these things matter. It's just, why don't you take something that you interact with people, not so much this last year, I'm sorry, but um, where you interact with people in your family, with yourself, with something you do every day, and do it in a mindful way. And this is what over 500 plus years, tea people have been doing. And they have been developing tea as a way to practice Zen and etiquette, food, flowers, gardening, all these other things have been tied into this wonderful thing called chado. And um, I, I'm a little bit remiss. Chado is tea, cha, and do as in the Tao, the way. And so, Judo, Aikido, Kendo, these are ways of training. And Chado does it through tea. That's what we're talking about. And one example I would like to give you, just to tell you how tea does this, is a concept that many people have heard about, but are actually quite mistaken about. Everybody's heard about a tea garden. And a tea garden, you know, like you go to San Francisco or Portland, and here's this beautiful garden you can walk through, maybe buy a, a bowl of tea, and oh, this is lovely, and you're outside, and you're watching nature, and maybe strolling, and chatting, sitting, and everything. That is a type of tea garden. But for the tea ceremony, for Chado, there's another one called Oroji. Oroji is specifically to the tea ceremony. And the roji translates as the dewy path. That, that, and that's from Zen as well. But it's a very specific type of garden that is used as a parable for Zen. It's actually divided into two parts, an soto roji, and an uchi roji, out, outer garden and inner garden. And in the middle is a gate. Outside the garden, the outer garden, this is where you've had a busy day, you've been working, now you're going to come and have tea, you're going to practice. And this is where you start to decompress. This is where you come in. And a roji 
doesn't have a lot of flowers. It doesn't have the stolen view that you'll see in some really beautiful Japanese gardens. It starts to bring you inward, inside, so you can bring in on that meditation that we were talking about. And when you come as a guest, your host will come out to a gate that's in the middle. And this is your gateway that we talk about. And this little flimsy gate is what is separating for a short time you and the rest of the guests and your host from the outside world. Leave all your worries behind. They don't matter for a little while. Come in, come through this gate, be on the path, the way, to come in and have tea. And tea, like I said, for over 500 years has been structured as a way to sit and practice and learn. So when you're actually making tea, your mind doesn't have to worry about what else is going on. You can actually have an experience, which I find is very rare for many people, including myself, of actually being someplace with your guest, with your host, with your utensils, and actually being there and experience it, directly pointing at what's going on. And there's another thing inside that gate, inside that chumon, that middle your roji is a basin of water, usually flowing water, where you purify yourself. You wash your but you wash your hands again before you go in and you get that last little what they call the dust of the outside world off and you get to go in. And so you come to purity. Purity is one of the four basic principles of tea. And while we're making tea later today, I'll be talking to you more about it. I just want to tell you what they are. It's wa, which is harmony. K, which is say, which is purity. And jaku, which is tranqu tranquility. And harmony is you're harmonizing with what you're doing, who you're with, what the utensils are. And it goes all the way down to, did I make a nice set of utensils for my guests to see? Are they harmonizing together? Oh, wait, that, that one really is distracting. Is that going to make it good? We can make it better. Ray, like I, at the beginning, I, I bowed and... There's a phrase, it's re ni hajime, re ni owaru. And it's everything begins and ends with a bow because a bow is a sign of respect to your guest, to your host, even to the utensils and all that brought you that. Somebody made those utensils. Somebody dug out that clay. Somebody cut that bamboo. Somebody built this thing. Somebody grew this. Somebody helped with the water. The, ra the nature, the rain came and helped these things grow. Somebody saved this to show you something special. You want to have respect for that that's going on. And it can be as simple as you have a friend coming over and you go, oh, I wonder if they'll be thirsty. I'm gonna, uh, let's see, I have some orange juice. I'll have some orange juice out for them. Oh, well, I know that they like that cup. I'm gonna get that cup for them. Oh, but now I wanna show them this new thing that we had to eat, so I'm gonna bring this out. Hello, cat. Yes. And um, so it's that kind of respect and that kind of harmony and that kind of looking together that you bring together. Purity. You'll see when you make tea or when you have someone make you tea, they 
purify and clean things. Everything's already clean. Everything's already spotless. But out of respect, out of harmony, and out of letting that other stuff go so your mind can be like water, it's clean again. And by doing all of these, you start to get jaku, the tranquility that you're after. So with that, I, I do want to uh, make one little comment that, okay, we're going to be making tea together. It's, you'll see in a moment, a videotape of a very basic type of tea. Very, very basic. But it'll give you an idea of what later when we're making tea together, where we're kind of leading you. And so with that, I want to thank you all very much for coming. I hope you'll enjoy and uh, learn and help your life make better. There is one comment I want to, to say. I, I, as I told you, I'm not a roji. I mean, uh, Roshi. Um, but I have lived with several Zen masters throughout my life. And this is a quote from Eckhart Tolle. And all of them are cats. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you. So that's where we're going. And next, we're going to have a short um, video of the tea ceremony. Just a very simple, a very basic one that a lot of people start with. And that's going to be kind of the framework of what we'll be doing after the intermixture together. So if our uh, technicians from Mars are up and ready with that, we'll play that. And I'm sorry about the sound breaking up. We'll answer questions later. I'm sorry about that. But um, this one is almost quiet except a cat occasionally. So don't worry about the sound. It's 10 minutes. Okay, not very long. Thank you. And now we're gonna hopefully have them play that.
Mukashiodozo. Please enjoy your sweets. Dozo Shimai Kudasai, please conclude the ceremony. Shimo Asate Itadakimas, I will conclude the ceremony.
Any, we have some people ready to go? Yes. All right, then we're gonna go ahead and get started. I see hands. All right, we're waving, good. Okay, then we're gonna go ahead and get started. And um, what this is, is an adaptation of the Tamai, the procedure you saw a few moments ago, just done with everyday things. So I'm thinking this is probably what you have at home. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. And here we go. Ocasio Dozo, please have your sweets. Everything in begins and ends with a bow. Very good. Now, I apologize, but I'm going to be talking through this whole thing. So whatever attempt you have at concentration, mindfulness, my apologies. I'm just trying to help you down the road. You'll see that we have everything arranged. The one thing that you probably didn't necessarily have in your own home is the chasen, the bamboo whisk, which we had mentioned in the in the uh, the little packet letter. But that is that is available. Little Japan carries them. Uh, All under heavy carries them, and you can get them online. So, it, and I do recommend that. That's why I've kept these as one of the two real tea items to, uh, well, three. One is the chasen, two, the actual sweets. We forgot, we forgot to grab some of those delicious little uh, sugar cubes that you'll be using. So we're using those and uh, a Japanese flower vase that we do use. Um, very much a part of tea is flowers. So with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and start following the basic procedure of that other tamai and we'll go from there. First thing you do is purify. Now, in the other video, you saw me take the cloth and refold it so I could wipe some of the utensils. As we said, they're already clean, but this is to purify them. And in between each article, we'll get rid of more of that dust of the world. Our very exclusive Chano Yu scissors. If you have some antique ones, now would be a nice time to use them. Next, we're going to be warming up the bowl and warming up the whisk.
Now this lets you examine the whisk and make sure there are no broken tines, anything that's out of sorts. And yes, we have our Zen master cat in the house with us. And we have our used water so we can go out on the garden. This is a damp rag. They're normally made of linen. Figured you probably didn't have a linen handkerchief that you wanted to cut up. So this is a piece of soft cotton cloth. Now comes the slightly odd part. Because our tea comes in the little tubes, we're going to cut them into the sifter rather than directly into the bowl because your tea will whip up much better if it is sifted. And the container you saw me use earlier, the tea had already been sifted. And I've been drinking tea for a very, very long time. And I like my, my tea very strong. So this is going to be made with two tubes. And contrary to what you'll see written many places, many places have the hot of the water too cool. That's the temperature you usually want to drink it at. They don't give you any lag time for when you're making the tea. So you want it a little warmer, just under boiling is the temperature you want to have in your thermos or in your kettle. And now I'm using a rounded spoon just to stiff the tea through the sieve. This will help it to whip up much nicer. And I recommend that if you are going to drink matcha that you do sift it. It will make it much more palatable and you won't get as much grit at the bottom of your bowl or cup. Some people do use cups. I find bowls much more useful. And please, please, please only use ceremonial grade tea if you're going to be drinking it. It's fresher, you can get it organic. It has more of all the good things people are drinking tea for, and it tastes so much better. Um, the culinary grade, if you're gonna make green tea ice cream, go for it. Don't use it to drink. It's much better to get ceremonial grade. Again, you can get that online, you can get it at uh, Little Japan, you can order direct from some tea merchants. Look for organic, Japanese-grown ceremonial matcha. You can get others, and once you've had some, you can explore out to see other tastes. You might other, other um, terroir, like you use in wine. Other regions have slightly different tastes in their tea. But please use ceremonial grade. It really does make a difference. And now we're going to pour about two ounces of water, which is a quarter of a cup, um, 60 milliliters approximately. I don't know what your standard is. Um, a double shot glass, double jigger. I don't know what your measuring system is. And try not to pour directly on the tea, but around the edge. And by doing that, you won't have it puff up in a cloud of green dust all over everything. Support your bowl and whisk. Use whisk going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Move slightly side to side and slowly raise the whisk up out 
of the water and slow down one half the speed, one half the speed, one half the speed. And you will have, I'll try and put this perhaps where you can see it. Uh, but I'm trying to get it in the light. Oh, no, that's all right. Uh, you'll, when you make it, you'll see it. Okay. Uh, this is Urasenke school style of nice foam tea. Uh, other schools don't like the foam. This is the one I grew up with. I like it. I prefer it. And I'm going to be the kind of guest I think you might be today and drink my own tea. Um, we've had the sweets. If you're not used to tea, I suggest you try a sweet now. If you are used to tea, you might not need it, but it can enhance the flavor. Um, normally, it's you ask your guests to take it just when you start adding the tea to the bowl. But I was distracted with the cutting, wasn't very mindful and forgot to do that. So we're having a sweet. Itadakimasu. Thank you. And there is procedure for turning the bowl. We're not going to do that today. Don't let your tea cool down. The one thing is a thank you. And then enjoy your tea. And the big slurp is part of tea. You do want to do that. You want a nice big slurp at the end of your bowl. It aerates the tea much like when you're drinking wine and opens up a lot of more flavors in your mouth when you do it. So I do recommend you have a nice big slurp and it lets your, notes, your host know that you drank it to the bottom. So you're the host and you should know that. Are you ready to take some questions? Um, I want to just talk about the cleanup and then we will take questions. Normally, if you're going to make another bowl of tea for a second guest, you would add hot water, pour it out, wipe it out, make more tea. I'm just going to jump to the end. I'll be pouring out, pouring in water, pouring it out, closing up as we go. Um, so yes, I can definitely take questions. So that's what I'm gonna be doing, but the instructions kind of give you an idea what to do if you're gonna make a second bowl. So I'm just gonna close up. So as I close, please ask questions. Well, Caitlin wants to know, where do you like to buy your matcha? Um, I have gotten it at Little Japan. Um, I did get it sometimes at, um, all under heaven, but then they had difficulty getting ceremonial grade for a while. For a while, the co-op in Arcata was able to buy um, a ceremonial grade. Unfortunately, they didn't store it well. They stored it in a very large open container that was light colored. They did keep it chilled, but unfortunately it oxidized and you want your tea to be a beautiful green, not yellow. So I didn't buy it in there. Other than that, we normally buy our tea that we use for our classes is at a shop in Japantown called Asakichi, San Francisco. Japantown, Asakichi, and they are wonderful people. They will ship you tea. They will tell you what, when the new teas are coming. They will give you different types of tea. That's where we normally buy our tea because we often will buy several tins at a time and get them in tins. Um, some people sell them in vacuum bags. If you do, make sure you get the air out, close them up and seal them up. And we keep them in um, a special drawer in the refrigerator. It just helps oxidation. And that's what you're trying to do. 
Um, as for price, you can go anywhere from $20 for a 40 gram tin, which is about yay big. And that will make um, sometimes 12 bowls of tea, sometimes 10 or me three, but no, not really, not quite that much. But, um, and then the prices can go up substantially and the quality goes up as much. So it's like ordering shots of espresso. And for those of you concerned about caffeine, yes, it does have caffeine. It um, will let you know later. The caffeine uh, delivery system in tea, in matcha, is actually often very calming at first. And then later, you'll say, oh, yes, I'd love another cup of tea. Well, no, I'll have one more. And a little later, you'll notice somebody just, because it will kick in, because it was used as a medicine. And to keep you not only awake, but one of its first uses in Japan, a Zen priest actually used to kill a nobleman's hangover, and it became very popular among the military class after that. So I'm going to keep going and cleaning this up. So please ask more questions. Michelle wants to know, is that a Siamese Zen master? <laughs> that child has... Child, cat. Cat. I'm trying to be nice. Has um, some Siamese in her every once in a while. She is white, all white. But every once in the sunlight, you can kind of see that the markings are there. And so, and she does have blue eyes. Well, sometimes they're a little bluish too. And you can tell from the voice that there is some Siamese in there. And she gives us many koans, often in the middle of the night, like, why are you asleep and you haven't fed me? Things like that. Why did you become practicing shadow? Tammy, I was extremely lucky because I was a good friend and student of a professor at Humboldt State University, Professor Lloyd Fulton. And he taught Asian history. And um, he had commented that he had built a tea house in his backyard. Well, I had to go see that. That was really interesting. And we would do things. And he says, okay, I'm going to be gone a year to Japan. And I've decided that since I built a tea house, that I should learn to do tea. So he found a teacher and they taught him how to do tea. And he came back and I'm going to do a class. Do you want to do a tea class, Hart? Yeah, that, that sounds fun. I'll do that. Well, I was very fortunate to live in the student housing right next to where the tea was being practiced. So I was able to go and help the tea teacher, uh, Hirose Sensei, that came from Japan to help teach the class. And so I was there. I got to have a lot of fun. I would, she would work me really hard. I would help her clean. I would do this. I would take the class, everything else. And I just really enjoyed it. It was different. It was interesting. And she came back the next year and I did it again. And she came back the next year and I did it again. And I was very fortunate because I would go in early and she'd teach me. We'd, I'd help through the class, I'd stay late, she'd teach me. And we were there very late one evening. And I said, Sensei, I, I just wanted you to know that I, I think tea is really, really good for me. I'm really, I'm, I'm getting a lot out of it. And she very quietly said, well, I didn't expect it for it to take you this long to realize it, but yes, now we're gonna practice harder. We have some more questions, actually several of them. Um, should we have used one or two of the tubes in each cup? Pat wants to know. Um, most people, and if you see most recommendations, one is enough. 
I, I use a minimum of two of the tubes because I do like strong tea. And even when I drink tea in Japan, many of the tea people are going, oh, you like strong tea because I make it even stronger. So, so we have a question about the sugar cubes. There's a, yeah. a, a confusion about adding the sugar. So oh. clarify. Um, tea, tea is not mixed with anything other than water. The sweet is taken in your mouth when the preparation is being made. So the sugar taste is in your mouth and you drink over it. If you've ever had um, certain types of Middle Eastern coffee, sometimes they'll even hold a sugar cube and drink their coffee through it. This is the idea is you, you sweeten your mouth and then drink the tea with it. And it changes the flavors in your mouth. Um, there's a question about using the paper or, or how do we fold the cloth? Oh, um, the, the folding the fukusa to wipe with and folding the, the, the damp rag to clean with, these are all part that you start learning when you practice tea. Um, I don't know if there are any, I'm sure there must be something online, but because I, I was taught, I haven't gone looking for it. Um, it's part of the procedure you learn when you start doing tea. And Holly and I were talking this morning that we don't know how we're going to start doing classes again for people. It's going to be a while yet. Um, we are still in orange and there are more cases. And this is a very intimate and very close procedure. And so you have to be very careful how you do tea in this pandemic age. So we're still working out how to do that. We might be able to do some kind of a Zoom class. We just haven't figured out how, where, and when. But do contact us at Harai Center. Um, there's a splash screen that'll go on at the end. You can find us at uh, Facebook. Um, and keep in touch so when we know, then we can tell you. It's just a lot, it's a lot to learn. And it's one of the first, very first things you learn in making tea. I think you answered the question. There were questions about how they can, how people can get in touch with us, right? Where we teach. So I think you answered that. If not, um, please, we'll... please ask again. Um, yeah, there was a question also about is matcha caffeinated? And I yeah, think yeah. Answered yes, it's caffeinated. And and matcha is actually the exact same plant. Um, Camellia sensensis. sinensis. It's the very same plant that oolong tea and Earl Grey tea and and bancha and and English breakfast tea. All the it's the same plant. It's just how it's grown, how it's harvested, and how it's processed. But it's the very same plant. Okay, Becca is asking about the paper. But I'm trying to think which was the paper, because there is a type of paper that's used in tea. Oh, the cream, right. Uh, are the, Becca, are you asking about the calligraphy? Mm, ah, okay. Are the calligraphy symbols kanji that we received one of the four principles? They are all four of the principles. Each character is with, with that. Hold on just a moment. There is in Japanese calligraphy a tendency to make very, very um, quick letters. There's lots of different forms of, of, of the writing. Um, it's like looking at the difference between a Roman block letter and something done in chancery uh, script. Okay, well, I can interject. Uh, there was paper that came with the kit, but it had only one figure, and I'm not sure oh. what that figure was. 
So uh, oh. it might be one of these characters. Maybe it didn't print out well. We will put this exact paper up on Facebook, Facebook for you to get these. And you'll see it's a simpler form of the calligraphy. Oh. Did Pat, it? Pat says that Georgia Long, who we met at our Oh, oh that's right. It's with her. And that's, I forgot about that. Yeah. I was thinking of the packet, but I forgot that Georgia was going to do a simple paper to go in with your packets. I forgot about that. I thought she was going to do the character for T. Oh, Georgia. Cha. Hold one moment. Hold on, Georgia. I'm going to pin you. So you can share that again. Would you share that again? It is. It's Cha. Uh, so that, that, that is the character Cha, also called Sa, but that is the character for T. That that it it it's a little bar atop and then a little house top and a little that's cha. That that's the word for tea. And when you start looking around, you'll see it in a lot of places. A lot of places. But yeah, that's cha. I thank you. That's I I'd forgotten she was gonna do that. They had <laughs> talked about it, but it'd been a while. And so I apologize. I forgot about that. But yeah, we will put we we will put this up because I know the in the booklet they had the four principles, but the kanji are done in what's called so uh, show, which is uh, a running script and, and very very wah. Uh, <laughs> so people are thanking Georgia for her beautiful. Yay! Yes. Tammy says, thank you for including that, Georgia. It really helped create a sense of atmosphere. Yes, excellent. And um, yeah, that's that, that's really nice. I forgot to mention that beforehand. I'm so glad you guys commented on that. That's good. Anything else I can help you with? Do, let's see, we, how much more time do we have? Um, well, Tycho want to play and they still want to do a drawing. Right. We could talk about um, Horai. We could um, talk about the, the parts of the video that got left out. Oh, oh, some of those words. Um, I'm, I'm really glad that Holly had put the words underneath. And many of those words will come up if you uh, even Wikipedia them, um, because they are such standard words in uh, they are such standard words in, in Zen and in, in meditation Buddhism. Um, the Nizu no Kokoro, uh, that mind like water, is you'll, you'll hear the stories of, of where you get clarity. And that's one reason they use that is because when, when a pool of water stops moving, the moon is reflected. You'll often see that as an analogy. And so we had um, Kensho, which is the direct understanding. We had um, uh, Soshin, beginner's mind, uh, that taking away your preconceptions when you're learning or doing something and actually being there with it. Um, uh, Shinengo, which is, is the, uh, the actual mindfulness, keeping your concentration without ushin, which is getting trapped, without getting caught. Don't be like that poor centipede. That, which one? Oh, oh um, um, I had to oh, I, I fall down. Don't, don't do that. It, it'll, it'll drive you crazy. You're going to do it anyway. But um, two more. Mushin. Mushin. Mushin is... You'll, when you read about Zen, you'll often say, they'll say, it did it. It did it. Uh, like your archery, boom, you hit the target. No, it did it. Or like when you're doing tea, you'll be do, moving and all of a sudden, without your thinking, 
your arm goes over and grabs the next thing you need or does the next thing you need. That's it doing it. That's your mind not there. You're, you're also observing your mind, no mind. And that's, that's when you practice hard and you learn well and everything else. There's another one that I am quite good at. And that is called Shin En. Shin En is one that happens to me all the time. It's called monkey mind. And monkey mind is when instead of having mushin, it's like, oh, ah, uh, ooh, oh, that I should fix that. I got, oh, wait a minute. No, oh, oh yeah. Oh, oh, that isn't the one I meant. Oh, it. So when when you when you think of monkey minds, say, oh, Harvey does this, you know. So well, next let's, question. Uh, make it quick because it's uh, time to go. Probably time to wrap this up. Um, but uh, people are asking about commenting on what Horizon Center does and uh, do we offer classes? We don't have any classes going right now, obviously, because of we, we have not had our regular class in almost a year. Um, yeah, long, long time and it, it hurts. But um, we do do demos occasionally. We have had some classes in the past. We're trying to figure out how to work that. The idea behind the Horizon Center was to get other people in the Pacific Ring, Rim is where we started with the idea, to show off their, their culture and share it. Um, we've had some Native American stuff help with local potters. We've had um, people from Hawaii, you know, things like this that we're trying to get everybody around the Pacific Rim and how we're doing it because the way we got into it is through tea. And so that's how Harai came about. Um, involved with the sister city? Oh, involved with the sister city. Thank you, Jay, very much. Um, Eureka's sister city, Kamisu, we were able to have them actually reestablish the sister city that it started a long time ago. Um, if you drive through Eureka from the north, there is on the left-hand side, as you make that big swoop, Kamisu Park, and the cherry trees were planted and a gift from our sister city in Japan. And we're hoping after this craziness that we'll have to be able to do a lot more exchanges with Kamisu and set up student exchanges between Eureka and Kamisu. So um, young adults, can go and people traveling to Japan have somebody to go and talk to that is a companion city. And that's our sister city, Kamisu. Anything else? I'm not seeing any more questions. So okay. Perhaps it's time to for us to get out of the way. Back over to, uh, Katie. To the okay. Thank you all very much. Everything begins and ends with a bow. A bow is Ray, R E A, Ray, R E I, excuse me, Ray. And that is a respect, an etiquette, uh, uh, a res you know, respect like K. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it.
Thank you for having Katie in the Clark Museum, catching my breath. <laughs> We're having Hamo Taiko and Tiger Love playing for the Gateway to Zen this afternoon. And I will introduce our Tiger Love group from Humboldt State and one from UC David. I don't know how he got here, <laughs> but somehow <laughs> he sneaked into the back door. But, uh, and sorry, just want to thank also the Inc. people for giving us this far grant so we can have the classes for these students here. And I um, want to thank them too. Thank you. And quick introduction. We have Jasmine over there. Makana? Makani. Makani. I always say her wrong name. <laughs> Yavana. Did I say that right? <laughs> Makito. <laughs> Brian. All right. My apologies. All right. All right. And we will play this song that we learned in 10 weeks. <laughs> we call it the Speed Tycho. Uh, it's called Rentu. So I hope you enjoy it. And then thanks again for coming. And have a good evening. So the last thing we'll be doing for today is our door prize raffle. So Dana, do you want to come over here and do the raffle? 
Okay. So the first prize is, let's see, what do we want to do? An orchid. Orchid. One of the orchids from Orchids for the People. Okay. And the winner is Yumi Ozaki. Oh. gift certificate from the co-op. Let's see the gift certificate from the co-op. Okay. So it's the $50 gift certificate from the co-op. Let's say drum roll. Drum roll, yeah. Yes, please. Oh, yeah. Let's do a drum roll. We're good. The winner is Molly Jacobs. And then let's do the other orchid. Okay. Other orchid from Orchids from the People. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Charity Moore. All right. <laughs> All right. And, and then our last prize, which is a tea set from Little Japan here in Eureka. And it comes with tea. So it's uh, this teapot and four cups. Oh. All right. All right. And the big winner is. <laughs> Gail Garman. <laughs> All right, so if you won a prize, if you live here locally, you can come by the museum next week to pick up your prize. We're open Wednesday through Sunday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, if you're not from the area and need to have your prize mailed to you. Uh, except the orchids. Except the orchids. Yeah. That would be difficult. Um, <laughs> uh, we, uh, go ahead and send us an email. We'll also send you an email to all of our prize winners. So thank you again, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, we hope you had a good time. It was a lot of fun uh, over here. And we will see you at our next event. Uh, be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram. Uh, you can also check out our website. If you join our newsletter list, um, you'll be some of the first people to know about our next programs, including our future tea events. And uh, if well, all of you will receive this recording in a couple of days, along with a follow-up survey. If you can take the survey, it really helps us to improve our programs and offer some really cool, innovative stuff in the future. So thank you again. Thank you to all of our participants, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>